Hello everybody and welcome on this uh, sort of dull but very close Monday afternoon. Um, good to be here with you again on ICB TV as we're calling it and lots to do today. Uh, Jackie Mount is actually coming on a little bit later because she's got some updates to give everybody, uh, some of them quite interesting. Uh, but also I'm very pleased that today uh, my main guest is Mark Buckley who has the very frightening title of Head of Intelligence and Enforcement, and he's with Companies House. So, hello, Mark. Hello, everybody. How are you? Oh, I think we're all right. So, tell us a little bit about uh, how you uh, in apply your intelligence and how you enforce thereafter. Okay. Um, well, Head of Intelligence and Enforcement is nothing to do with my personality. Um, <laughs> it's, it's basically the, the part of the Companies House business that, that I run. So I've got a I've got quite a, a wide ranging team of about 140 people. Um, mainly, they deal with things like um, compliance around PSC, persons of significant control, um, late filing penalties, um, technical breaches, those kinds of things. And then I, I've also got a small team um, that works with enforcement partners. Um, and provide sort of intelligence and analytical services for those on sort of live cases and sort of investigations and things. Okay, and we had a, um, well, in my case, a brief meeting with Companies House last week because I was late arriving. So having arrived and said that I'm here and everybody was just about saying they were going, you, um, your team very kindly began to give me a bit of a rundown. And I said, well, well this is great, but why don't uh, one of you come on uh, um, to the program or next week or, or whenever? And you very quickly volunteered. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, because I was quite interested to hear some of the stuff that was coming up, particularly the emergency filing service. So that's, that's all um, obviously based around the dreaded COVID-19. So to all our members who've got their clients sort of sitting there and wondering how and when they got to file their accounts and are they going to be let off for the next 10 years or whatever it's going to be, how does it all work now? Okay, um, well, I think, I think I can start with the emergency filing service. Um, <clears throat> essentially, we've got quite a few documents um, and processes that are entirely paper-based. So the emergency yeah. filing service isn't to replace those services that we already have a digital service for. This is simply to aid um, delivery in most cases of paper-based documents to the registrar digitally. So um, some of the first documents that we have put through the emergency filing service are the registrar powers forms, so things where um, registered office and directors are being disputed um, and a few of the other registrar um, powers forms. So they went live last week and I believe that there's an update to that service that's gone live today or tomorrow and it's due to go live. Um, there's a, a long list of sort of forms in a priority that my colleague Amy Harkham, who's leading the sort of task force on this, is, is sort of looking to, looking to develop. Um, some some of, of the paper-based documents aren't suited to an emergency filing system, a service rather, because um, some of them need an end-to-end -end process, and that takes a little longer. Um, yeah. But, but it, it, Amy, is, Amy is developing the sort of those documents that can be run through the emergency filing service, and, and then those that need a sort of more web-based or more traditional um, delivery method. Yeah, because I, I came down with the, uh, sort of the group that we work with you on on the other professional bodies, and we had a, a bit of a walk around, and there's, there's still a lot of dependence upon people looking at a file and, and going through it and seeing what's missing and various other things. Um, do you think that if you move towards more technology, not just the current PDF, but further into technology, are you going to be able to trust it as much as you do the all-seeing eye of somebody that's been with you for 10 years and knows what they're looking for? Yeah, I, I think, I, I think that, that's, that that's the next sort of stuff um, sort of things that Amy's team are looking at. So um, whereas the emergency filing service are for forms that don't need authentication, the next yeah. step that she's looking to put the 
the emergency filing service are forms that do require authentication. So they are looking at, at processes for that. Um, but obviously true sort of validation and verification is something that, that, that will come sort of further down the line as, as, as we, we get through the sort of consultation that the government has just undertaken. So you've got about, what is it, five and a half million businesses registered, limited companies? There's, there's four, I, I believe, and don't quote me on this figure, because um, I, I can just hear my colleague Kira Willis now shouting, it's not official statistics, but it's about 4.3 million live companies. Live companies, okay. Yes. Yeah, okay, so non-dormant in other words, yeah. Yeah. Because so, a lot of companies take on names just to protect them, don't they? Keep them yeah. away from everybody else. There will be dormant companies within that, but they are classed as active companies because they still have to file accounts and, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so being, being alive and active doesn't necessarily mean trading, if that makes sense. So four points, well, more than that, live companies filing accounts plus uh, or dormancies. Then there's uh, annual returns, etc. That's a lot of a lot of paperwork or a lot of documentation yeah. to look at, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the main the, the main documentation that, that that we take in. So I think um, confirmation statement. I think that's ninety nine point something filed digitally. Um, yeah. Accounts are now up in up in the high seventies, if not eighty percent digital. Um, which a few years ago that that, that was relatively low. Um, incorporation ninety nine point something digital. So you know the, the the main main bulk of what we do is predominantly digital. It's just yeah. the, the the sort of um, the lower volume filings. So for example, we recently introduced um, a digital means for getting insolvency documentation to the registrar. Historically, right. we, we get about 160,000, 170,000 insolvency documents oh. per year. Um, the, the, the registrar functions documents, I think we get around about 30 to 40,000 of those a year. So, so they aren't you know, in the millions where we've already digitized. So these are low volume documents. But obviously, the importance to get your information updated, the importance for for UK PLC <laughs> for the company is insolvent. Everybody checking out, yeah, absolutely. At the minute. <clears throat> so, um, persons of significant control. Yeah. Where, how did that come about? As as opposed to a list of directors and responsible officers or whatever they used to be called. What what's the big difference? Um, okay. Well, I th I think I think this is this is a sort of a government. A, a, a government sort of um, beneficial ownership is is is, is a, a worldwide is a worldwide issue. It's about knowing who owns the company, um, yeah. or who's pulling the strings behind the company. So it's not necessarily the directors, but it, it and it, in, I have to say, in most cases, the person with significant control and the director are one and the same. But yeah. in some of the larger companies. The person who actually owns the beneficial ownership of a company isn't necessarily one of the board of directors, um, and I think that there that there was recognition that there was a lack of transparency of that sort of date set throughout the world. So um, the UK introduced the, the first truly transparent persons of significant control of beneficial ownership um, register. Um, and my colleague Lee Robbins is the expert on that. So, so um, if you if you want a discussion solely around persons of significant control, how it came about, how we manage it, um, that, then I, I can put you in touch with Lee. Um, because he, yeah, no, I've spoken to Lee in the past. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is that we come across this, of course, because of the anti-money laundering regulations, and we're all guided by them. You know, we live, eat, and breathe them, or wake up screaming at night because of them, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, I think actually it's, it's been very good for us as a profession. I've said this so many times because I think bookkeepers were somewhere in the background, but now we, it's brought us to the front. But it, it, such a lot of what goes on can yeah. be seen at bookkeeper level before it gets anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's important that we're in there. And, and certainly persons of significant control, you've, as you say, you've got to know who's pulling the strings. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of our members say, well, you know, I'm, I see this man, he says he's a managing director. Isn't that the end of it? Well, no, it isn't. You know, uh, the managing director is often somebody, as you say, it's just been put in there to keep everything ticking. 
Uh, yeah. No real power or anything. So, so it's quite good to do that. I mean, our members use your services very, very regularly. We have I don't know, 150,000 small business clients. Um, majority of those are now limited companies. So once a year at least, our members are all expected to go back through their due diligence for everybody. So your your web checks, I have to say, is an absolute godsend. And I use it very regularly for as an assortment of reasons. But um, what you, I think one of the things that the, the money laundering group said many years ago was that uh, with, with a company's house, you are a repository of not of this knowledge, but you don't necessarily check it all out. And it was a, it was a problem that we can't say, oh, well, if it's come to us with a company, uh, you know, it's registered at a company's house, it must be bona fide. That's not part of your remit, is it, at the moment? At, at the moment, it isn't. Um, you know, I, I think our register is still based on the tenants of when it was created around 1844. So th th this is, you know, a, a, a gentleman's agreement. Uh, which is how the sort of partnerships and, and sort of limited sort of liability was created. Or, or, and the, the underlying function of the registrar hasn't changed really since then. It is simply a register. There, there never has been um, a requirement on the registrar um, to actually validate the information that he or she has been putting into the public domain. I think that has come into sharp focus over the last sort of, well, certainly since I've been working um, within the sort of intelligence and um, enforcement integrity space, um, and I've been working in this area now for about four and a half, five years. Um, and I think from when I started, I think that the, 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 the government were, were sort of happy with the way that the, 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 the tenant of the register. But I think over time, um, as technology and fraud, fraud and fraudsters have sort of mm. have been able to use and abuse, um, you know, the, the, the register, I, I think that there's been a, a growing pressure, I suppose, to actually take a look at, 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 the, at the rationale of what the registrar does. Hence, we had, a, we had the consultation um, back last year, um, a sort of unprecedented amount of, amount of commentary on, on that. Um, but unfortunately, obviously, with, with sort of um, the general election, and, and now we've got COVID, um, obviously... The, the and Brexit first, in between. And Brexit in between, yeah. I, I, I try not to mention the B word, um, but, you know, with, with, with all of those things, um, which have sort of come all on top of the end of our consultation, or just after our consultation, really, um, obviously, the, the, the government are, are st still still waiting to be able to publish the results of that consultation. Um, yeah. I, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a time scale for when that is, unfortunately, given everything else that, we, that we're dealing with at the moment. Yeah, because um, you mentioned the other day, you have about a thousand people working down that in your office, but 950 of those are now working from home, or <laughs> yeah. well, most of them are, that aren't uh, sort of distanced for some reason or another. So you've got 50 people who drew the short straw, and are presumably, um, keeping their distance somewhere in, in the office at Cardiff. Yeah, well, operationally, um, the majority of those will be in our, in our sort of postal, postal services yeah. part, part of the operation, um, just making sure that, you know, documents that come into the building are getting out to, to the relevant areas. And then, um, so, so my own team, I've got um, two, maybe three people coming in um, on, on, on a daily basis to sort of scan documents, paper-based documents out to people that are working at home. But then no. I've got colleagues then working in the background to actually digitize the front end of that process so that we stop getting the paper and it comes in digitally, which then becomes easier to manage workflow and things at home. But at the moment, we're in a, we're in a bit of a hybrid of a, a bit of both. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the postal bit is, is the bit that's intrigued me. When, when I came down for the visit I mentioned earlier, and. I was a bit taken aback when one of my colleagues, one of the other bodies, who I won't mention because it, it's quite embarrassing, he was saying, oh, no, no, you can't stop using checks because he said, I, I, the check's useful for me because it gives me that, that extra few days while the check's in the post. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, that, that's just a step too far backwards for me. I mean, there's, there's, the electronic stuff is so much easier, so simple. And uh, but I, 
he, you know, he was told quite firmly that actually nowadays, if the check arrives without a signature on it, it isn't logged as being in. So you can still get a penalty when they send it back to you. So that old ploy is definitely gone. Yeah, yeah. well, um, you, you know, um, we changed the law back in 2006 um, to actually account for, for, for those types of scenarios. Um, yeah. to, to make the payment a tangible sort of thing of delivery. Um, so yeah, any, any yeah. Company that should have a payment with it, or if the payment is incomplete, it is, is, is sort of sent back, and then obviously implications around late filing penalties and things like that would kick in at that point. I think one of the things that I find um, strange, not really when you think about it, but dealing with government departments is, you can't do anything until it's been legislated for. So you come up with a bright idea one day. Oh, that's a fantastic idea. It's actually got to be legislated for, or else somebody will catch you out, and that's it. Yeah, it's, it's, I think, I, I, I think it, it, it depends whether or not it's a brand new thing, or there are things that you can get away with within, your, <laughs> within, within the tenants of the existing framework, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Um, so, so a, a great example of that, which kind of, it's almost as if we practice this, is the sort of easements that, that we've done for, for sort of, um, for companies. Yeah. Um, you know, w w when restrictions hit, obviously th th there was a lot of, th there was a lot of sort of um, government intervention in terms of helping, helping business and making, you know, giving sort of grants and loans to business. And obviously, Companies House were looking at their processes and looking at <coughs> during this time, how can we um, help sort of businesses A stay on the register um, so that when we come out of when we come out of restrictions and the UK gets back to whatever whatever sort of normal is when we when we come out of this, um, how do we sort of help and assist companies to do that? So we've done that in, in, in a few ways. So obviously the first thing we looked at was any company that that was due to file a set of accounts, okay, but hadn't um, hadn't hit their sort of um, due date so hadn't, hadn't sort of gone into default yet. Um, we introduced um, an automatic three month extension to 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 companies on application. Yeah. But, but to help companies to do that, um, we 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 developed. Um, a, a sort of digital portal for people to be able to deliver their applications at the moment is either email or hard copy letter. So we yeah. deliver a digital tool to allow people to, to deliver that application. So, but the big word is application. So you've, you've, got to, you've got to ask, not exactly for permission, but you've got to tell somebody you're coming in late, yes? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 so that, that's the bit about doing what you can within the existing legislation. So previously, I think we used to get somewhere around about 50, 60 applications a week, um, all email, and a human would, would look at every application um, and then agree it, yes or no. <coughs> this system was built to do exactly the same. So just accept it in digitally and then throw it over to, to a human to say yes or no. But what we did, as part of this was to develop a metric within the system that provided certain criteria were met on application, but that request would be automatically granted. So you wouldn't have to wait for a human to pick it up. Uh, okay. Yeah. I remember a couple of years back when uh, I, I used to make sort of regular trips across to Brussels to go to the European Parliament. Uh, yeah. Those were the days. Uh, and our representative over there, uh, Dr. David Doyle, um, he, I, he used to talk, I used to um, sort of sit in the background and, and watch what he was doing. But one of the things was that uh, the rest of Europe seemed absolutely amazed how quickly you could set up a company in the UK. Yeah. Um, and that, this was seen as a good thing, not a bad thing, but uh, you know, that some of the countries, and I think Spain was probably one of the worst, which takes about seven months or something rather to, to register a company. Um, on the converse of that, anybody can do it in this country. And sometimes I think it can be a little too easy, but hopefully once that's been done somewhere within the system, whether it's the bank or the bookkeeper or the accountant or whatever, we should pick up the people that, that really um, are, are not um, 
properly running companies, which is it. But uh, it, was, it, it was one of the few things I've ever been, um, I've heard the British have been praised for in Brussels, but I thought it, <laughs> it was thought it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah well, we, we, I, think, I think, again, that is a want of um, the UK government that, you know, Britain is a good place to do business. But obviously yeah. with that, I think we, we do need some sort of checks and balances to make sure that the people who are filing are the people who you know say they are filing and the people who are who, who are on the register the directors the persons of significant control are those are those individuals um and you know and i, I think we we consulted on, on that and i i think that that is that is the future but obviously i can't preempt a, a sort of government consultation on that but i think given given the sort of where we are in terms of um, things like uh, the financial action task force those kinds of things and, and the reports i think but all fat yeah, yeah. Change um, <laughs> so you you have a team of people that physically check the accounts make sure that the right person has signed them that they have been signed um well we, we have for paper yes we, we check that um the accounts have been signed um and obviously that, that's a human doing that so you know that, that, is, yeah. that is subject to error um as as with anything where, where where sort of manual intervention is required um digitally um we require sort of authentication codes emails and things from, from from professionals so um the, the authentication code that, that we issue to companies and governments and agents is is the form of authentication that we see right yeah it's so Intelligence is obviously finding out the problems. Yeah, yeah. So enforcement. Now, what exactly do you do to enforce? Do you, do you literally go and knock on people's door or what? No, no. We we don't have we don't have those kind of we don't have those kind of powers. So oh. enforcement is sort of um, is essentially prosecuting people for things like non-filing breaches of the Companies Act. Um, I think the, the the biggest penalty that we actually prosecute for would be. For the for the false filing or the fraudulent filing, um, you know, and, and we, we prosecuted three or four people for, for that type of offence where they knowingly provided false information on the register. But again, because I think because of the way that we capture the data, um, proving some of those some of those bigger offences at the moment is is quite challenging to get the yeah. evidence and, and gather the evidence for it. But I think. As we move forward and we change the way that we capture information and, and things, I think it'll become more and more difficult to, to evade um, sort of prosecution and enforcement for those types of things. And then obviously, yeah. obviously we, we enforce sort of um, non-filing or persistent non-filing of um, accounts. We've also got the late filing penalty regime, which is, which is very effective. Um, yeah, yeah. We've got world-class compliance rates. So those that we do issue penalties for are a small percentage of overall overall filings. But again, so, it's it effective yeah. tool. So if our members find something that doesn't look quite right in assessed accounts, they're looking because obviously we look at accounts, we look at uh, lists of directors, etc. Yeah. Uh, one of our members came across one recently where the person signing was not actually a director, but was was signed as the director, yeah. had been a director for several years. Do you want us to report that sort of stuff? And if so, to whom? Um, yes, you, you can report that. Um, you can report that either to inquiries at Companies House, um, right. or if, if after this um, you contact me and I can give you um, in, internal emails from my, from my own team where, where you can report those things directly. I've also got, a, I've also got um, a, an accountant on, on my team that looks at looks at accounts and things forensically on account, on complaint and works with HMRC um, on, on, on things like the Digital Economy Act, so the work that we've been doing with HMRC and things. So we, we do have sort of limited capability. Yeah, yeah. Um, we quite often get asked, I mean, at the moment, the, the tool that's available to um, a bookkeeper is a SAR, Suspicious Activity Report. But that's mainly around money laundering, and a lot of what we see may not necessarily be, be money laundering. You know, it's not terrorist financing, it's not helping somebody get drugs or that sort of stuff. 
it tends to be around fraud, uh, you know, where we deal. So that doesn't come to you, obviously. But yeah, some of the things where you know we know we we tell our members they search the company, but they they must also then search the individual directors to see what else they're involved with. And um, you know, we expelled somebody recently who got twenty two and a half thousand businesses registered to his seventy dashed house. You know, there's got to be something wrong somewhere. I mean, he, he might just like registering companies. He might. But anyway, we, we'll ignore that one. <laughs> I don't know the reason for it. And, and we're working very closely now with um, HMRC to make sure all of our members who are trust and company service providers um, are registered. You know, it, it's it's one of those things. It's a high risk area, as you know, because um, of all the people that uh, like our uh, company formation scheme, the, the Russians seem to really enjoy it. But, uh, yeah, no, you, you can't comment, neither can I really, but never mind. I, I think, well, I, 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 I think there are sort of, um, there, are, there are pockets around the world which are higher risk than others, um, and not necessarily sort of linked to Eastern Europe, but there are other areas around the world which, yeah, yeah. which, 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 which are, are risk, um, and, and that's kind of where sort of my, my intelligence team sort of works. <laughs> So, so, so they, they, they take, they work with the, the, the data analysts internally. They look at sort of um, filing patterns and, and sort of, so if we get a complaint, for example, you give us a complaint uh, around a company, we would then look at, look at that company, look at who filed it, look at, the, look at the payment details, and then do analytics then to see if there are any other matches or similarities on the register with that. Um, and then, then we would sort of look at the sort of risk areas around that. And determine which of our enforcement partners would be best to look at that sort of thing. Yeah, um, you know w whether it be um, insolvency, HMRC, I don't know, may maybe the police, other enforcement agencies we work with, trading standards we we've got a great relationship with. Um, you know, All right, okay. so we do get fed sort of intelligence from others, and then we will do analysis and feed that back as well. And and the and uh, sort of um, on the relevant gateways. Yeah. Um, so, for example, if, if we got a, if we had a complaint from one of your members about a about a company with accounts that seem too good to be true, um, then obviously we get our accountant to look at that. But we'd also do analytics under under the hood of the company's register because yeah. we, we can access data that you can't. So, if you're looking at the flat register, it's it's easy to sort of hide on the flat register by changing yeah, yeah. directors and things, whereas it's not so easy to hide underneath. You're generally the same credit card or the same email or things that are used to incorporate those companies or deliver those documents. And, and, and yeah, as part of the uh, money laundering regulations, talk them again. Um, we had to put in a a whistleblower line. I always call it a dobbing in line because I can never remember whistleblower. So I've written it down. Whistleblower. The whistleblower line. Um, and we couldn't really understand why that would be necessary because our members have got ways of reporting. But actually, we've had a, a number of calls on it from non-ICB members who think it's about bookkeeping or accounts and as we're the institute, therefore, it, it must be something to do with us. And we've been getting all sorts of weird things on there, including, as I say, this one about um, uh, one of the pro another professional body, not, not nothing to do with uh, accounting, but a professional body, I think it was, um, where the, chair, the former chairman, who now lives in, in uh, the south of France somewhere, was signing off the annual account. So we didn't know quite what to do with it. So I, well, I'll pass that one on. Um, but anyway, the, these things do happen. And it, it, it's surprising. There, there always seems to be somebody out there that's willing to try and fiddle something, which is a shame, isn't it? But, you know, it keeps us all busy in enforcement, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. So what's your big wish, then? If you, if you could... Uh, you know, get either government or the public or businesses to agree with something for you. What what is it you would like for Christmas, as they say? Um, that's, 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 I, I don't really know. Um, it's a really good question. I suppose. I suppose at the moment, I think collaboration with with enforcement partners, given the powers that, that we currently have. Um, so you know, if if anybody if anybody knows of information that is, that is incorrect on the public register, they, they they just need to let me know. Um, and and the, the more sort of organisations like yourselves that we, we can come out to and sort of um talk to about this sort of stuff, 
Um, so, so, so that is my big wish at the minute. Um, and, and then I think, I think moving yeah. forward, um, let's see what comes out. The, let's see what comes out the government consultation. Um, yeah. and, and go from there. I mean, we do have quite a strong uh, branch network with around fifty odd branches around the country. We've actually got one in Cardiff, which is which is a, quite a big one. You know, they they meet on a regular basis. Um, so yeah, it would be good to do that and uh, you know to see what comes out of that. The bit that you were saying before about your powers of enforcement are uh, sort of perhaps a little bit limited in many ways, which is weird because under the under the MLR money laundering regulations, uh, we as supervisors now can demand entrance to a property, yeah. which I'm touch wood, haven't actually used that one yet, but apparently we can do that. You know, we, we can go in and demand see papers and all sorts of things. We, so somebody just forgot to add that into the legislation when it was going through, presumably, with you. Um, no, I, I, I don't think that the, 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 the register of companies was, was ever intended as, as a sort of, um, a sort of an enforcement body in the same way as perhaps the HMRC or the Insolvency Service. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. It's been given. You know, it's a registrar, it's a registry, and that is that, that has been our sole purpose. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure if the intention is ever to ever to give us those powers. Um, but I'm actually, think enough people have got that power. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, there, there are enough people, and I think I think between us, we are becoming more and more joined up in terms of being able to sort of ser service sort of um, th th those organisations throughout the UK. Uh, so, Judith Siddle, one of our members here, says, so a director with 16,000 registered companies to their name, should yeah. they be highlighted to you? They certainly I, should be highlighted to the ICB. Yeah, well, I, I think th th there are business models out there where people will set up companies in their own name and then, and then sell them on. So just because the director has 16,000 companies yeah. doesn't necessarily that he mean that he's running 16,000 companies or that that's necessarily... Uh, a sort of um, anything suspicious, I think, yeah. you, you know, be, because that is a, a, a natural model. There's never, there aren't any limits within the Companies Act for how many companies an individual can um, set up as a director. So, you know, yeah. um, I mean, mean sixteen thousand sounds like a lot, but I, but I, I mean, yeah, it's it's something we tell say to our members quite often. People, if you've got. I don't know, ABC bookkeeping, you then have ABC bookkeeping and accounts, ABC payroll, ABC bookkeeping and payroll, etc. just so that nobody else gets to use it. And then you leave the rest of them dormant. And, you know, I, I, there are, as you say, very often very valid reasons why people have done this. But, yeah, 16,000 sounds a lot. I think you just have to look into them and see what's going on. One of the big things that we say to our members, if, if you look at the register and you find that someone's got a lot of uh, uh, companies, are any of the companies being cross-traded? And, you know, you need to make sure that it, it's not set up for that reason, etc. So, you know, the various things happen. But I, I think generally, um, I think people use the head. I mean, I like to think our members um, look into something before immediately reacting. But anyway, I'll talk to Judith about that later, just in case it is somebody we should know about. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, uh, you you're going to get through COVID, hopefully, as we all are. Then everybody yeah. ramps back up and starts again. And then there are going to be a lot of companies that have, unfortunately, fallen into difficulty over the last two yeah. months or so. And it's going to be a bit of a big sort-out time, I think, for you. Yeah, I, I, I think so. So at the moment, as well as the sort of um, the extensions easement that we put in, um, we've, also, we've also introduced um, easement measures for... Those companies that have sort of defaulted on the delivery of accounts and confirmation statements. So ordinarily, they would go down a default process where we would issue three, four letters maybe, and then it would get to um, First Gazette, and then, you know, it's still more contact, it would be struck from the register. So with those types of companies, um, again, because we, we think that a lot of those companies may be needed post-COVID, but obviously due to restrictions in access to registered offices and things like that, they might not be seeing these sort of letters or maybe having problems delivering accounts and confirmation statements and, and various other things. Yeah, yeah, I see. So, so we've, we've paused. What we're doing is still sending out the reminders, but 
preventing those companies going into into a, a, a gazette state a because that'll have an, a negative effect on their credit rating um and and b we, we don't want them going into gazette and second gazette and off the register because that, then that is just sort of building up building up a, a sort of issues for us further down the line in terms of expensive restoration cases can, yeah. you know by us and and by um and by companies who will need to be focusing on other things when we get out of this. And then yeah. similarly, um, for the for the, those companies that have um, applied to be struck from the register, we're allowing those to, to go to first gazette stage, but we're holding them there. So I, I think the rationale there is, A, we don't want to allow those unscrupulous companies the opportunity to sort of wriggle off the, wriggle off the sort of financial hook with HMRC maybe, um, and, and yeah. um, but obviously, to allow sort of companies to ob ob object, so, so cre trade creditors, those kind of things, or again, whose focus may be elsewhere and, and not on the Gazette or, or the or the public register at this time. And th but when they get out and start trading again, we'll have the opportunity to object to strike off for, for any of those companies. Uh, our members um, are being encouraged more and more now to get involved with actual filing of accounts under FRS 105, yeah. 102.1a. Um, obviously, we think they're all doing it wonderfully well, as are all accountants who obviously never make mistakes, he says with, with a sly grin there. But anyway, um, are there any plans for you to be able to come to somebody like ICB and say, look, we've got a few problems with your member down in, I don't know, Tony Pandy or wherever it might be. Uh, could you have a word with them uh, before we go any further? If somebody is a repeated offender, gets things wrong all the time or something? Yeah, I, I think I think at the moment we we are looking at the powers in, in that area. Obviously, to be able to share information with with regulators, we need the power to be able to do so. So, yeah. and and the, the the only reason that we would have a need to come to to you as a regulator to say you know so and so and Tony Pandy is as as sort of filing these these things. Or we are seeing a lot of sort of fraudulent transactions on the back of some of their filings. Um, yeah. we, we are unsure whether we've got a gateway to do that at this moment. And again, that is something that we are looking at as part of yeah. reforms to understand where the holes are in, 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 in our ability to be able to sort of um, communicate two ways. So, so you tell us of, of, of things, but then yeah. we would also like to, to be able to... to um, tell regulators to, to give you better powers to be able to go and sort of regulate your, 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 own, your own clients. And at the moment, um, we, we don't think that we've got the gateways to be able to do that. So that, that, that yeah. is one of the gaps. Yeah. Um, I mean, at the moment, the information from us tends to go up and doesn't come down. And I think somebody somewhere is going to test it one of these days to see whether we can be given some information. Um, because you know, if, if somebody is working with a company that I don't know, HMRC or uh, NCA are looking at, it would be good if they could come to us and say, I think you've got somebody here, you need to be careful, make sure your member's okay, keep on. And, but yeah, it, it does take it on to a whole new level then, doesn't it? Well, well it's, it's, it's not just yourselves that we would have that with, you know, given, given the regulatory community is quite large in the UK and, and we deal with most of them, um, you know. Yeah. I think I think it is part of the part of the fraud triangle bit that, that, that we are missing at the moment. But yeah. we are looking at ways of, of sort of plugging that gap. Yeah, uh, we've got Jackie Mount online somewhere. If Jackie is around, and she'll she'll have to plug. I'm probably frightened to death now. She'll plug herself <laughs> in. Yeah, there we are. Jackie is our chief technical officer, head of technical advice, whatever else you want to call her. I can't see your face, Jackie. No, hang on. I need. Uh, 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 you don't really want to see my face. It's seen enough of me. Hi everyone. Hello. Aren't you a South Wales girl? My mother is. Valley's um, girl. Yeah. Um, from where? Caffili. Caffili. Oh, all right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, back among friends. But uh, yeah. anyway, Mom's you've been back. listening in. You've been listening in. Yes. So all this uh, 105 filing that we've been preparing for for years and years, and finally got it into the syllabus. It's all. Uh, it's all coming to it's all come to fruition now. We've got a lot of members using it. Yeah, and I think it's a really good addition to our uh, suite of qualifications that bookkeepers who have been working with 
clients' accounts on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis are able, providing that they are straightforward companies, uh, can then go on and do the filing under the year end because there are no issues. But we make it very clear that if there are very complex situations, then uh, they should think really hard about um, whether or not they should file or pass it on to somebody else. But um, that's, yeah, we found it very useful. A lot of good feedback on it as well. Yeah, so, um, I mean, how many errors, Mark, are there a year in the accounts? I, I got some horrendous figure of tens of thousands once upon a time when I asked, how, how bad is it? Well, I'm the clues. It, it, it's, it's not something that our system actively checks for at the minute. Or we All right. the ability to do. So, so basic things like the closing balance of last year's accounts don't meet the opening balance of this year's accounts. You know, um, we we don't actively check for that kind of thing at the moment. Um, you know, I, I think I think we we don't have an army of qualified accountants to be able to sort of pull through the data in, in that sort of level. Um, I, I think what we are looking to do is to try to improve our digital services and put yeah. that quality stuff in. But again, that, that is a, a long-term transformational goal because again, um, it's the, the, the act basically requires a copy of the accounts to be delivered to the registrar. So if the registrar is receiving a copy of the accounts that have been signed off by, by directors and, and Whoever else is required to sign them off, then to check those things and say, well, actually, the open balance, open balance don't match. That's the copy that was signed by, by everybody. Yeah, yeah. 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 Does that make sense? But so, I think that's become slightly easier with the software developments that have happened over the last number of years where everything comes directly from uh, the software into one of the tax. Yeah calculation software so you just transfer it straight on and i've been heavily involved in with hmrc with the making tax digital um for that and also for year end and uh, for, for, for sole traders yeah. and uh the whole idea of that process is that uh, providing that you're transferring uh data across and not copying it across so yeah. you're not reversing figures or something then that should should cut down the errors anyway and i think that um Continuity of software is is going to help that. Yeah. I, I think I, I think we have we, we have three forms of delivery to the registrar. So obviously we have the software route, which primarily works exactly like you mm. said it does. But then there's also a web based our web based sort of package, which again a lot uh, you know a, a lot of sort of um, agents will do because obviously it's a lot cheaper than a lot cheaper than um, purchasing software, and then obviously paper. Mm. And the, the, the paper that we receive are just sort of accepted basic checks in terms of accounts signed. They have the relevant sort of yeah. you would accept, but the actual narrative and the figures and things aren't aren't checked or validated by anybody internally within Companies House. Um, but as I say, as we move more towards sort of a, a data a data analytical model um, down, down the line. Those errors, those data errors, should should be better and better. Do you check whether a set of accounts has been filed under GAAP or IFRS, international standards, or does that not come into the realm? No, no. Again, that that that, that wouldn't be something that uh, our examiners, particularly on paper, would would, would, yeah. would know about. That's more of an HMRC concern then, rather yeah. than you. Yeah. I say, we we do work closely with HMRC on those types of issues and integrity around the, the, the right site, the right type of account that's being filed uh, with us and with them. And, and, and we will engage with, with, with companies to, to, to get them to amend filings where we see things that are happening. Or where we well, technology is wonderful stuff, but actually I've, I've just been passed a paper here to say that we, we have two routes into watching this today live. One is via our website, but a lot of people come in via the uh, Facebook page, the ICB Facebook pages. We've got one for each branch. We've also got one for students. We've got one for members. And there's thousands of people spread across these things. Uh, just to say that uh, they didn't get on very early, so they're sort of halfway through now. But I, I, Claire Allen, Nicola Payne, Tony Domene, 
uh, and Alison Bradley, I do apologise. Uh, you can re you can uh, look at the tape of it later on Facebook. But I hope you're on, and I hope, I hope you're interested. So that that might explain why a few people haven't turned up. So um, yeah, the 122 was supposed to be coming through that side. So that that would have been a nice number. But um, I think our members always leave it right till the last minute. They want to know who's on first, and we don't always tell them in advance. So. Uh, other than nine, they were all booked within the last two hours. So it, it, I think it then boils up the system or something, other, you know. But uh, still, never mind. Um, well, there is Mark, a, I think, sorry. Sorry, yeah, I was going to say, there is a question coming from Facebook that says, um, if you don't check the account, do you check about who signs the account? Is there a check made for who signs? And I think this came up earlier, actually, and if it's a, a relevant yeah, again, person. Again, we check the accounts are signed. Um, but we don't actually check that the, the, the signature is of a live director. And in a lot of cases, we wouldn't know because X can sometimes mark the spot. But also, um, when, when the accounts are signed off, yeah, that individual may well be a director at the time, but may not actually be a director when the accounts are delivered. Those kind of things, there's all manner of nuances. But again, you know, we're dealing with three and a half million sets of accounts per annum. 70, 70, 80 percent of those are delivered digitally. So, so the rest of that, you know, however many hundreds of thousands of sets of accounts, we, we simply don't have. We don't have the sort of scope, the the, the sort of um, the legend requirement, or, or, or the capability to be to, to be able to sort of check documents to, to that level. Yeah. Yeah, because that's about three thousand five hundred sets of accounts per member of staff. So that, that's a lot to get to, isn't it? Really not everybody is, is on the front line there, but still. Um, the, the digital accounts, um, by and large, uh, once they pass the, the, the system validation checks, um, yeah. because the, the signature, signature for those is the authentication code. Once it passes the other checks, the name, the number checks, you know, that, that, that it's got a data set, and they, they get applied to the system. Whereas the paper ones, there are obviously those validation checks have to be done by a human. And as I say, to, to go into the into the narrative of a set of accounts again, that's not our remit. Um, you know, that, that's why we got bodies like yourselves with those skills, specialist skills. Um, and, and we just check that, you know, the requirements under the Companies Act are there. And then place that into the public domain for consumption. Uh, I've just had a, a message come through because... Um... In the past, when I've done uh, presentations at conference or at, at uh, our various seminars, I always quote there being something like 5.5 million registered limited companies. Now, you said there are about three and a half. So no, no there's three and a half. It's around about three and a half million million accounts. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm working this out off the top of my head. So not every limited, right. limited liability company is required to file a set of accounts. Yeah. Right. And, and then, and then within that, then there are other other things that that would take the, you out of the live pot. So things. If, yeah. if, you, if you're if you're at the third stage of our strike off process, that takes you out of being a live company. So whether right. um, there's a total pot of four and a half million companies, majority, there's six seven hundred thousand of those are newly incorporated, so they are not required to file accounts this year. So you take that from the 4.3, you dump the 3. Point whatever it is, and you guys yeah, are yeah. me. And then you've got uh, okay. companies, companies who are insolvent. Though, yeah, companies who aren't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. That are left over that are live and required to file accounts. So, so that, that's why there's a difference between total register and amount of companies that file accounts. Okay. And there are no plans for uh, self employed people to have to register with you at all at any stage. No. Just that you're just, I think, generally speaking, they're just being encouraged to become limited companies wherever possible. There's well, been a bit of that for years. Yeah, it, it is it, it is easy to set, set up a limited liability company, but obviously there are there are sort of um, controls and statutory requirements that, that come with that for any individual that does, yeah. um, you know, and costs of, of accounts and, and things like that that have to be sort of published on a public register. But yeah, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that there's that there's anything in the pipeline that will require sort of um, individual. Okay. Um, is there anything you want to say to our members that you think is important? Anything they ought to be looking out for? Anything they ought to be doing? Or anything um, we could help you with? Well, 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 well I think 
if as part of if as part of what you're doing, um, you see anything suspicious or you think is suspicious, um, no matter how sort of how sort of um, not mediocre. What's the word I'm looking for? How sort of low level you may think that is. Um, just pass it over to us because you know any information that, that we get from organisations, um, we take seriously and, and, and we do and, 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 you know we, we do we sort of do validation and sort of an analysis on it, um, and, and quite often somebody will see something that, that looks like a sort of an isolated case, but when we look behind the scenes, some, more often than not, it is part of a wider a wider issue. And, and then obviously we, we would we, we, we would work with um, other partners then to sort of look to see whether that should be taken forward. Um, I've got one here from Faye very quickly. I, um, she's obviously rattled this off very quickly. She said, I'm sorry, I've just logged up. Actually, Faye lives around the corner from you, so she could walk up and ask for it, but never mind. Uh, just got logged in. Sorry if I asked. Do you look at directly sort of companies set up and used after one other limited company with associate directors has gone bust? I think she's trying to ask if, if you sort out whether you, you check out directors to make sure they're not on the list of um, directors yeah. gone okay. bust or something. So, so disqualified, disqualified directors or bankrupt directors, um, we actually um, register the disqualified directors information on behalf of the Secretary of State for the, for the Insolvency Service. I mean, yeah. yeah, so all of that information then sits in, in the front end of our system. Yeah, so when companies try to incorporate with a director who is disqualified, okay, that automatically gets bounced. Right. Um, and if it if it pass if it fails that check because perhaps you know the, the, the name, the address match, but perhaps the date of birth is slightly different, that then gets flagged for somebody internally to um, look at and chase up. Um, right. we also take a uh, a feed of all the bankrupts within the UK. And again, a sim similar a similar process. That sits on the front end. If somebody tries to incorporate a company with who is who is bank with, with a bankrupt director, that gets yeah. bumped as well. So I'm not sure. Now, just had a, I've had well, oh, great. I had one of our members, Pauline, who's just sent one word: insignificant with a question mark. Did you say something was insignificant? I must have missed that. No, no. Um, no, no, no matter how, if you see something that's suspicious, no matter how insignificant you may think it is. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Intended to us, it, it doesn't matter. I've, I've got a team of people that, 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 that can look at that and analyze it, um, and, and you'll be surprised. You know, you, you, you guys will have a better nose for this sort of thing. Um, and, and if you think, it, think there's something not quite right, then please send it to us and, and, and we can look at it. Yeah. They're pretty good at sorting things out, and, and, and you know they have a nose for it. I think, and I would say, look, if it smells bad to you, it probably is bad. So give, give us a heads up. Yeah, no, absolutely. That. So, um, okay. Well, look, thanks very. Wait a minute. What's it? Thanks very much for that. Uh, yeah, Sylvia Borhill here just saying, do you want us to support to um, report suspected problems? Yes, we do, Sylvia. Yeah, sorry if you. I think you're one of these people who came on a little late. Uh, we can see it later. Yeah, um, we're going to get a um, get something up on our hub to show where it goes to. But yeah, absolutely, definitely. And if you if you've got something in a hurry before you know how to send it directly to Company House, if you go to our whistleblower line as opposed to our normal line, um, we're going to make sure that everybody there knows what they've got to do with it. So uh, thank you very much for that. That was brilliant. Is there, uh, they're coming in now? Sorry, I was late. Says Sylvia. I apparently Sylvia. Yes, it's all right. Don't worry. I understand that that is uh, our problem, not yours. Uh, so, Mark, um, we're just going to do a bit of a catch-up with HMRC and the, the dreaded furlough and various other things at the moment. You're um, happy for you to stay in if you wish, or if you now need to disappear off somewhere and uh, go and um, look at do something else, then please do. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's been really good of you to come. I'm great for coming on at short notice, and uh, it's one of the few times where being late for a meeting has turned out better for us. So <laughs> I'm going to try it again later. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll, I'll pass you those um, those dedicated e email addresses for where your guys can send. Um, yeah, please, that would be good. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fantastic. All right. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank you're you, welcome. Mark. Thanks for inviting me. See you yeah, guys. My Cheers. And Jackie. Yes, right. A couple of updates I'll today. Stay away from this place, can you? No, I know, I know. It seems ages since I saw you last. 
A um, couple of updates happened today. Um, firstly, the business bounce back loans have opened up. They opened up this yeah. morning. Um, it's done again. The link on the HMRC website will take you through to the British Business Bank. I haven't followed it right through, but I think it's exactly the same um, as previously. And as I understand it, they're hoping to get um, approvals through very quickly. I did see somewhere 24 hours, but I'm not sure. Yeah, um, seven questions apparently. Yeah, there's not very much, and it's um, a maximum of fifty thousand um, pounds up to. Tw sorry, yeah, the maximum you can apply for is twenty five percent of your turnover up to a maximum of fifty thousand pounds. I think the minimum is two thousand. So that is a much shorter, quicker process to get some uh, very fast uh, loans in. Uh, interest fee free for the first year and six years then to pay off. You don't have to pay any payments back in a year. So basically you get the money for a year and then you paid off over the next five years. That's how that's going to work if you want to take it that way. So the banks involved are Barclays, Lloyds, NatWest, um, and I gather Starling Bank are just about to be added. Uh, what else? Dan Danske Bank, Clydesdale and Yorkshire Bank, and Ulster Bank. Oh, and Santander RBS. So uh, that's all that's available at the moment. And of the new challenger banks, I think Sterling's the only one that's mentioned. Starling, sorry, not Sterling. Starling is the only one mentioned at the moment. But yeah, it's all available and ready to go. Okay, the other bit of news that's come out uh, today, and I was hoping to be able to tell you this on Friday, but it hadn't been released for general knowledge, so it's come out this morning, is that the, um, the self-employment grants, uh, say, S-E-I-S-S, -S -S, are now that well, you can't apply for the grant but what they've done is they've issued something called an eligibility checker this morning um if you go onto our covid19 hub, hub if you scroll down to the self-employment bit i've actually put a link to the eligibility checker and that will then take you straight onto the application page for that um basically what it does is you put in a utr and a national insurance number and it will tell you instantly whether or not you are entitled to a grant just to try it out because i'm not self-employed i put my details in and within uh, three seconds came back and said nah can't have one which is as it should be and they gave me a choice of reasons but that's fine so at least i know that that works um by now you should know the rules it's to do with the number of tax that the, that you've been self-employed that you submitted a tax return that you're continuing to tax and as we said on friday that you um you are applying because you have lost profits due to covid19 now mike we have mike uh, was asking a couple of questions friday afternoon about that um we talked quite a lot about the ethics of applying for this if you haven't lost profits because you are being asked to declare that your profits have been affected What's going to happen if your profits then pick up towards the end of the year? I'm not sure. We can't get that out of HMRC, but basically um, it's there for you. Uh, and the vast number of small businesses will have lost money through this, so most people will be able to apply. Um, Judith Siddle here. Have you seen on Judith Siddle? I have made a second claim for furloughed staff today, and HMRC track have confirmed a weekly claim can now be made. Yeah, now I had a bit of a situation with HMRC over this because I, from my contact at HMRC, we were told that you can make weekly claims, but somebody said on the, that on the webinar last week that you can only claim every three weeks. You can claim weekly. I've had that reconfirmed this morning. Um, and also what I did have confirmed this morning, which was interesting, is that I've been uh, conversing with one or two members about actual furlough dates. So if you're applying for, say, May, and or for the end of april say and your furloughs will be uh maybe the have only had two weeks and the third week comes in the next month that it is okay to apply when you do your normal payroll runs and as long as at the end of it they've been paid a minimum of three weeks furlough um and your you can justify your claims over the three month period of the furlough that's going to be absolutely fine, but do keep those records. Um, going back to the application for the SAIS grant, agents oh, yeah. can apply, um, can go through the elig eligibility checker because all you need for that is the UTI and the national insurance number, and you can do that. And the idea is that agents can go through that, find out whether they are clients are entitled to apply or not and give them advice about what they need to do. 
However, as it stands at the moment, and there is a, a big discussion going on between all of the other professional bodies at the moment, agents cannot apply for the grant, and it's very clear on the HMRC website. Um, so what we alluded to on Friday was that if you're in that situation, you should make sure that your clients have their own government gateway login. Now, we all know how long that can take, but what's come through on an email to me, and I'm going to read this email out, we will put it up. It says, it basically says, how can customers get a government gateway account in time? Will they have to wait for a code to be sent through the post? And HMSC's answer is this. There will be no requirement for customers to wait for any pins or codes to be sent to them through the post to register for a government gateway account or the SAIS grant service. Customers will be able to verify their identity using details on their passport or driving license. This will all be done instantly online. So what you're going to have to do if you have a client who um, we, if you have a client who's going to have to do this by themselves, who you think is going to have some problems, then possibly guide them through the process. They're going to have to make the application themselves, but you should be able to give them maybe the, um, the, the dates and anything. HMRC have all the information there and you don't have to apply for an amount. HMRC are going to tell you what they're going to give you. So it's not like the uh, CJRS furlough scheme where you're having to work out your 80% and put a claim in each week or each month for different amounts. HMRC have the information and they will tell you what the grant is going to be and it's going to be a maximum of 7,500. That covers March, April and May. We don't know yet whether it's been extended into June. If it is, there may be an extra application process, but that's... Um, where we are at the moment. Um, those are the two updates from today. I'm just looking at the questions coming in. Bit of an update here on children's nurseries from Faye. I've had an update 1st of May that oh. further stuff can only be done after the council's money must be used to pay staff. So you were, go you were going to get a couple of these. Yeah, I was asking on Friday for anybody who's got early years nurseries to, uh, if they want to get involved in one of these meetings, it's very, just, just the people that are involved. I've had about three, four people contact me. I just wanted to try and set up a little Zoom meeting for us all. It's not going to be an open to everybody meeting, just to get a flavor of how you're coping with this and what your views are on this. Um, because this has cropped up for one member in particular where they're being advised to do something which we don't agree with. So um, again, if you've got my email address, uh, email me directly. If not, can you go through member services? Email please, member services at bookkeepers.org.uk. I'll contact you and we'll try to set up a meeting later this week. Um, I'm thinking possibly Thursday, maybe late Thursday morning might be a good time to do that. Um, so that's what I'm thinking about, but I'll email you all in probably tomorrow. Um, the Our friends at the bookkeepers again oh. saying that the banks are only lending to their own customers, which I suppose they're, they're likely to do, aren't they, really? I, I can understand that, I suppose. But uh, uh, Barclays system is live for the bounce back loan. Applied for one this morning, and they say funds will be in the bank account tomorrow. Bit of a clunky system, as only went live at 11.30 this morning. That's Liz. Well, well done, Liz. I mean, that's, if you've managed to pick that up, that's... That's not bad, is it? I wish the banks were uh, all No, the, what it is, it's going to come back with some, a date. There are going to be four days in which you can start to apply. And, and, and I'm not sure how they're allocating, but it's done on a first come, first serve basis. But starting somewhere around the 14th of May, I think, when you log on and you do the eligibility checker, you'll be given a date and time at which you can apply. And that's the earliest you can apply. You can apply any time from then on. The reason they've done that is that they don't want however many hundreds of thousands of self-employed people to be going in at the same minute and applying for the grant. So there's a period of over starting over four days that yeah. you, can, you can make the application. Lucy Brown says so she's tested the system this morning, tried this morning, it's something that I was eligible instantly. Speed yeah. is great, but a bit basic. So that's, that's it, Well, enough. it don't forget, it's only an eligibility checker. It's, it's, to, it's to tell you that you're eligible to apply, and I think it's to give you a date and time to apply. The rest of the information comes in later, because 
they've set this all up so that it instantly asks questions when you put your UTR in as to whether you are actually valid and able and eligible to apply. Comment here about the size from Linda Grant. Will, the size grant will be taxed. I applied this morning and got the gateway user ID instantly. Yeah, that's what they said this morning. So that's good. Not nervous. Yeah, Nikki there says that uh, she can reply, but I have some clients that have been affected but have not been able to set up a gateway account to submit as they do. Oh, do not have passports. What will happen Driving to these clients? Licenses. Oh, driving license. But I mean, if there's someone who, who doesn't drive and who doesn't have a passport, and I know one or two people that don't, um, you might. Can't you get something at the post office? You pay yeah, four think, pounds. You used to. I, I didn't think you? you can probably get something. I'll I'll ask about that. Suzanne said it does work, Jackie. As I had to assist a client to, today, no authorization code needed, only identification required. It's so good well, to know that something's actually working quick and fast, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, the uh, SACE grant will be taxed. That's going in as income against uh, any other income. You'll just report it as income on your self-assessment. That was from uh, Linda. Got Gateway ID instantly. Uh, yeah, Nikki, that's the question about the passports. I'll, I'll find out about that and come back to you. Um, oh, Faye, my client followed all staff on the 24th of March and they're now going to pay back the council funding. Okay. This is a very tricky one, this council funding for nurseries, because the, the council grant is not just for paying staff, it's, it's for a contribution to paying overheads as well. And as I said, I really don't, I've never done a nursery when I was working practicing so I'm not too sure about how that works but we'll get back to you on that one. Linda says you can verify using your credit score details. Really? Ooh. Does she mean credit card details? No it might be mm, credit score. Hmm. A bit more information Linda if you could I think that might be useful because you foxed me a little bit there. Uh, um, the bookkeeping team, do you know about amending a previous tax return? I've read something about that somewhere and I can't remember what the answer is. If that's Kevin, I'll get an answer out to you, Kevin. HSBC um, says, Carol, tell me they would require a debenture from my client to secure a bounce back loan. Nope, um, that's wrong because yeah. bounce back is completely unsecured. Yeah. yeah. It'd be interesting um, to see which bank and it'd be interesting to get some information on the bank uh, so that we may be able to follow that up with HMRC on that one, or the Treasury on that one. I'm sure you can sort something out, Carol. You're a formidable woman. Oh, Linda, it's credit card and phone contracts, etc. Yeah, so it's credit card, I think, yeah. So that, that's Linda, okay. Credit card uh, phone contract. Carol, yep, that's what I told them. You're a formidable woman, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant, okay. Um, there was a bit, one of the, Top there, uh, Jackie, in this list. Something about sorry, completely off topic, but I have another furlough. Question. Oh, yeah, I was. I'll, I'll come back to that one. I've got them. I'm just looking on the uh Facebook Clydesdale, found it was someone applied to Clydesdale and found it easy. Uh, says, yeah, okay, that's fine. I'll feed all this back to HMRC as well because I've got an email I'm building to my contact at HMRC, so I'll feed this back to them and they'll be pleased to get some good news from me. Yeah. So right, think... let me go back to the furlough question. Um, right, and then let me just read this furlough and then I'll come back. This is from uh, Susanna. Right, let me read this, Gary, and then I'll come back. Yeah, anyway, just, uh, just while Jackie's working on that, tomorrow, um, we have not one guest, not two guests, but three guests, all from Intuit tomorrow. They're coming to talk to us. Uh, I'm going to ask them some pretty tough questions about what they're doing with small businesses and how ICB and they can work together, how our bookkeepers can actually uh, get involved with some of their clients because we're finding that there are clients that are doing their own bookkeeping, not just through Intuit, through lots of other people, and getting themselves into a bit of heavy water. Uh, the fact that it's on a computer instead of on a spreadsheet or the back of an envelope doesn't necessarily mean that they know exactly what they're doing. So I know a lot of you 
Uh, when I mentioned yesterday that over 10,500 new clients were registered to you all last year, a lot of you have said that it's with people who thought they were going to do it themselves but didn't, or it's gone haywire, or they still want to do a bit of it, but perhaps not the whole thing. So it's all good for business. And so hopefully tomorrow we'll find ways that we can we can link into all those um, Intuit clients that have been looking at the television advertising and, and buying up that uh, software, which uh, uh, I have to say seems to be getting a lot better reports than it did uh, 20 odd years ago when we started the ICB. It, it, it was one of the, um, well, it was a bit like Marmite, I think, in the old days, but it's becoming very popular. So, so it's good to see that uh, coming to our conferences has obviously made all the difference. <laughs> um, Susanna, your uh, query about furlough, I've copied it across. Um, I'll give you a call on that because it's a one-off anyway, and that's going to need a couple more brain cells than I've got available to me at the moment to work that one out. So I will either call you or I'll email you, Susanna, if that's okay. Yeah, the bookkeeping... What, what is it, Jackie? I can't read it on my bookkeeping business, is it? Not your mix of the rule, always. Uh, bookkeeping team, is it? Team, Kevin? that's it, right. Um, just saying they're annoyed that only certain banks can do this. I gather other banks will be rolling this out, but yeah, at the moment, I think they've gone for the main high street banks that have got the facility to be able to take large numbers of applications. Somebody was saying this morning within the first hour, I think it was Lloyds have picked up 5,000 applications, so they've got to have a large infrastructure behind them. And I think some of the, the challenger banks are, uh, are very uh, cloud-based, but they don't have huge backup in numbers. Suzanne says, thank you. That's great, Jackie. Well done. All right, I'm just looking to see if I can find something on Kevin's query online to see where I... Now, can I just ask those of you who are on Facebook, if you are going to join us tomorrow, and I'm sure you will be, can you try and log on a bit earlier as we had a bit of a, um, a problem when 122 of you tried to get in on within a, within a 30 seconds of each other so apparently some of you were a little bit late I'm uh, I'm not 100% sure I've never come in via Facebook so I don't know how that all works but uh, as far as I'm concerned they, if you come in through my ICB in this way this seems to be working okay we've, we've had no problem so we'll see Busy reading now. Yeah, no, about. I can't. I can't find my thing. I've I've got down the queries on the previous tax sheet, Kevin. I'll come back to an art with an answer for everybody might be interested in that one. So I'll come back to you as soon as I've got an answer. Linda says I was watching an accountancy webinar earlier, and they are furious. They won't be able to apply for sites yeah. on behalf of their clients. Yeah, I'm not sure why they've done that because everything else it's can. It's fraud. Their their reason for that. We had a long discussion about this on Friday morning, and they're saying that to. It's different to the uh, following scheme that apparently for, for you to be able to apply, it's going to take a lot longer to link it across to the agents. Why? Because, you, you know, if you've, got, if you've got agent credentials at the moment, why they can't do it. But it's um, to do with fraudulent applications is their answer to that one. So, but yeah, the accountants are really up in arms about it. Ah, and Kirsty St. John says it often says waiting from 2.55, so it's waiting for us to be let in. Sorry, Kirsty. And uh, by the way, I have mentioned your name again, Kirsty St. John. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at that and see if there is uh, anything that we can do. To be honest with you, I'm not sure. Um, until uh, we all got uh, locked down and all the rest of it, I must admit I haven't used this meeting for that much. I do have a, a, a weekly meeting with my uh, chief executive out in Australia tonight being the question we're now 11 ha 11 hours behind them so my uh, meeting this evening will start at 10 o'clock and knowing, knowing the chief executive from Australia will unfortunately run way past midnight so but, uh, I'm, I'm sure you feel really sorry for me um, I'm just looking for that's covered most things apart from the ones I'm going to have to come back with later so far. Julie said, I came to the ICB, didn't receive my little till about 3.19. Oh, I looked into that as well, Julie. What's this? Is my yard. Well, the problem isn't with Facebook, it's with the link. They've done the wrong Facebook. So I'm, get, I'm getting uh, a brief here from uh, She Who Shall Be Obeyed. Uh, Peter Moriarty's 
long ago that to say that it's not Facebook that's the no. problem. It's the link. What link? This one. As a link with this yeah. for the questions. All yeah. oh, right. Okay. It's the link apparently that's not quite working right. Oh, Gary, this is Sobi. Um, oh, no, hello, Sobi. The issue was with um, the server. Um, I think it just because everyone registered for the webinar at the same time, it just delayed getting the links out. But people should have received it. Um, oh, okay. We'll, we'll have a look. I know we've got hundreds on. So uh, anyway, I hope you're all enjoying today. Uh, I hope none of you uh, missed Mark, or at least too much of Mark. He was uh, he was great, and you know tells us quite a lot about what goes on at Companies House. I must admit, whenever I've got anybody who is Welsh, I tend to go into a Welsh accent, and I can't help it. It's it's aping them what they do, and I, I'm quite embarrassed. Um, but uh, I, I managed not to do it this time. I managed to be very good and be very careful. So, how are we doing? Uh, Kirsty said, you know, I love ITV TV. Well, thank you, Kirsty. It's only because I keep mentioning your name over and over again, but anyway, that's good. Uh, Faye, try a kiwi one. I'm not sure what that means. Is that a pina colada of some sort? It sounds like a good idea. Um, very good, actually. This is a, Ah, Julie, very good, actually. This is the first meeting I've been able to listen to. Thank you. Julie, where have you been? Um, but don't forget, they're all available. Uh, if you've got the nerve to sit through them, they are all available on uh, YouTube and Facebook and, and all the rest of it. I think we, this is I think this is number twenty five. So you've got twenty four to go through. It's a bit like a box set, really, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> possibly not with the same sort of outcome, but uh, never mind. And um, murder still happens. Sorry? Murder can still happen. Yes, murder can still happen, says June. But uh, <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. Hopefully not. Um, although I must admit, I had a another Zoom meeting with the team this morning. And I, I must give a shout out to uh, Julius Tafora, who's our finance director. He's been with us 10 years today. So we had a bit of a, a thing for him there, um, a, a virtual party. Uh, but earlier than that, we had a meeting trying to talk through our exams, a, a thing very close to uh, Jackie's heart. And I think I've been um, locked down for too long. I was getting so frustrated with this meeting and I, I, I had to leave the room in the end because I couldn't, I couldn't see a way through it. But in my absence, it was sorted. So I think that says a lot. Um, but anyway, um, what else have we got on here? Uh, accent fail. Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, the Welsh. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, are we most of the Zoom calls and just post the link on Facebook? Not really the last minute, then. Yeah, I don't know. I'll have a look how we do that. I'm on the, on the phone and emails constantly, Julie. All right, okay, good. Um, Jackie, I think probably we've outstayed our welcome. Um, yeah, I have two queries. I've got two queries that I need to go back on, so uh, I'll try and get back to people. Um, two or three queries, I'll follow those up, and I'll either contact you individually or we'll put something up on the on. Did you mention the comment from Nikki Bennett on the Facebook side? Just tested the size, size you call it, you? eligibility checker. Quick and easy, tell me when I can apply from. Gave an option to create an account if I didn't have one. And when I logged in, I could add updated information. Oh, that's good. So no, that's good. I mean, try and make it simple. Turn it around pretty quickly when you think of what they're yeah. going through at the moment. Um, and uh, thankfully, uh, I don't have to stand up uh, in front of that, those. Uh, journalists and answer the same damn silly question every day that they're asking at the moment. Uh, uh, I think I think the only online repayment we're probably waiting for now is uh, SSP. That's still not there. Okay, great. Well, I think we'll we'll call that a day for today, Monday, tomorrow, Tuesday. Don't forget, come and listen to what the people have got to say from uh, Intuit QuickBooks. Uh, the three of them coming on. A uh, bit about compliance, a bit about working with small businesses, etc. Uh, a good source of uh, new clients, I think, which is what I've said before. So come on, let's see what they've got to say. See if there's any way that you can pick up more clients if you need them. And uh, if you've got too many clients, about time you took on some staff. Oh, right, okay. We're, uh, we're looking at taking on some extra staff, actually, at the Institute. We are trying to figure out how we're going to interview people on Zoom and whether or not we can to work out how good they are but we're, we're going to have a bash at that so thank you all uh, for coming on again 
Thank you for the really kind words that you've been sending, other than those of you who couldn't get on today. So uh, we, we'll chase that one up. But most of you, thankfully, are saying that you're really enjoying this. It is useful. And we're only here for as long as we are useful, um, so I'm told. So there we go. And we will keep you in touch after tomorrow with some other things that are coming up. And we just love being here for you, being here with you, and anything else we can do to help, please just contact the office. We're all around. We're all there. 0203 405 4000. And why not take this opportunity to sit one or two of those new exams that you've always been wanting to do? You know, take on the payroll or the self-assessment tax or something like that. They're all available. They're all available. Nobody at ICB has shut down at all. We're just in different places. So we've got offices in Blackpool and Wakefield, uh, Hook. Where are you, Jackie? You're out in Kent somewhere, aren't you? Um, I'm East Kent. Out in Kent and various other places. And June and I are stuck here in the middle of a, an increasingly noisy centre of London. I think oh. people are giving up a bit too early and becoming uh, a bit lapsed. I hope, I hope it doesn't go all wrong. But anyway, so thank you all, everybody. And hopefully see you all tomorrow. Bye. Bye.